because the last piece of this that we um, need to do is, of course, put this into the context of supporting a site decision. And so I'm just going to, uh, I'll give you an example of the Hanford, the DOE Hanford site where we use this to um, justify shut, shutting down an SV system. And then Dave will tell you about a private site where we set some remediation targets. So I showed you this earlier. Basically, at the site, the site decided to write a document that said, we're going to apply this guidance document, this SVE tool. Here's how we're going to do it for our site. Here's a flow diagram that shows you how we're going to do it and the decisions we're going to make. And first, it's going to tell you about what data we have for the CSM, because we know that's what the document, the guidance document recommends. It's going to tell you what we did for our regulatory setting, and, and we're going to finalize that. And it's going to tell you how we're going to look at our calculational data specific to the types of things they had been doing. So they had mass discharge data. They had a, a number of different cycles. They had rebound data. So we kind of put some specifics on that and put together a flow chart. We put together a, a timeline of all the data that we collected so everybody could see the data we had to feed into our conceptual site model and parameterization of the calculation approach. We talked about the site conceptual model evolving over time. So back when SVE was started, we talked about what that looked like on the left-hand side of the plot and how we our data pointed to how that had evolved over time and why we think that, that for therefore we collapsed the Vado zone source to a certain area. So we put that in the document. We talked about the cyclic nature of our pumping. So basically we had yearly rebound tests and how those uh, uh, told us how the source was changing and how we interpreted that in terms of the source strength. So we put that together. We talked about the source location in using our SVE wells, which were basically looking at individual well pumping data from those wells, we were able to show that the, through tomography that the source was indeed within a, a zone with constrained vertically and laterally. So we put that together. We also talked about the existing groundwater contamination, which at this site is above the threshold where the groundwater vapor, vapor is moving upward from the groundwater at this site at this particular time. And so that was important to establish. And we, what we did is we built a chart and we said, well, here's a chart of um, for Henry's law for carbon tetrachloride where we have the gas soil vapor concentration on the y-axis and the groundwater concentration on the x-axis and if we're in the blue zone then the vapor is going to go up from the groundwater if we're in the orange zone vapor is going to go down so, so it was an easy way to to talk with everybody about where are we now and we could put a dot on there where we're at in the blue zone so people knew that context and then where that helped us is we said well here's our situation the plot on the on the left-hand side, we know we've been diminishing this source. Like I talked about before, we think this source is going to continue decay, to decay because of the mechanisms involved with diffusion. And then on the right-hand side, we put that in the context of the groundwater plume. So the groundwater plume at this site is enormous. It's going to take many, many years to clean up. And so the orange line on the top is the expected concentrations in the groundwater over time. The blue line is the contribution from the Vado zone source. And then with source decay, it will reach our um, target concentration well before our groundwater would reach that concentration. So therefore, we're confident that we can, we've diminished the Vado zone source enough, especially in the context of having some additional time for essentially attenuation to help us out. So this was an example of how we walked through this process and. Because we started with the data and the conceptual model and had a structure to walk through it, everybody at the table could say, all right, I got it. We'll sign on the dotted line. We still have monitoring afterwards, right? You're always going to monitor after a decision, but we had enough compelling information to make a decision. This is, uh, this is a project I've been living with for about over six years now, and uh, I'm actually consulting uh, with a regulatory agency on their behalf and overseeing work done by the responsible parties. Uh, it's an interesting site. It's uh, <clears throat> one that uh, actually was the result of very limited disposal over less than two years. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it has uh, a fairly thick uh, Vado zone, uh, you know, uh, 80 feet thick, um, coarse grain material near the, near the surface down to maybe 20 feet or so, finer grain material below that and then just for fun there's a basalt flow 
interjected into the middle of uh, this fine grain unit. So the fine grain material is above and below the basalt layer. And then currently with a active pump and treat system at the site, the water table is uh, roughly 10 feet below the bottom of the, or more, uh, below the bottom of that basalt. Um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, contaminants are a mix of different VOCs uh, at the site, so it's a multiple contaminant kind of site. Um, the remedy uh, as specified in the rod included capping the site, soil vapor extraction, plus the pump and treat system, and all that was implemented in the early 1990s. The uh, original soil vapor extraction system ran for a few years in the, well, actually in the mid-90s, uh, and they had pretty high concentrations. They actually had a thermal oxidizer there. The SVE was actually shut down for uh, after a while because of concerns about dioxin formation. Systems stayed off for quite a while, uh, and they continued to monitor groundwater. The pump and treat continued to operate. What they started to see in the 2000s was that uh, groundwater concentrations and a number of wells started to increase, including wells that were upgradient of the the source area, which was this disposal pit, and. They realized at that time that vapor transport was a significant mechanism by which contaminant was being transferred to the groundwater. They went back and looked at the soil vapor concentrations and they had rebounded tremendously to hundreds of thousands of micrograms per cubic meter uh, and over a broad area uh, much larger than the, the expected um, or, or the known release zone. Um, <coughs> the uh, Mass removal, as you can see there, has been pretty pretty robust. They, they've had uh, over 100 tons of VOCs removed from the site. Um, the uh, mass removal rates are still uh, approximately 1,500 pounds per quarter, so it's still going reasonably strong. Um, they uh, had been using, <coughs> uh, well, let me just take a step back. Uh, in, because of the increase in concentrations in the soil gas, they realized they had to restart. So they did restart. They didn't come back with the thermal oxidizer. They actually used uh, a geo unit, the pressure condensation unit at the site. Um, and they thought, well, you know, that's kind of an expensive treatment, but, you know, we'll be done in six months. Well, they weren't done in six months. Uh, they started in 2006, and as I kind of mentioned, they're still going uh, 10 years later. Uh, only recently, last fall, did they switch over to uh, carbon, uh, carbon treatment uh, because the economics now are such that it makes sense. <coughs> well, <coughs> getting to the point here, how did we use feet? Well, there's been a number of different performance goals for this soil vapor extraction. Originally in the rod, they uh, had said that through modeling, the soil vapor performance goals would be set. And initially, back in the 90s, they set it using sea soil modeling. And, and that worked for a while. <clears throat> of course, you know, that was their goal. They, you know, they had the problem with the dioxin concerns and that. Uh, when they restarted the system and they started thinking about it more, they said those sea soil goals were not appropriate anymore. So they uh, decided to reevaluate those, and uh, the agencies actually issued an explanation of significant difference that reset the goals uh, based on equilibrium soil gas concentrations with, uh, you know, that would be in, in equilibrium with the uh, soil concentrations that would represent no threat to groundwater considering leaching only. These are state or state standards um, and assume things like uh, two and a half centimeters per year of recharge and, and uh, you know, but it was entirely leaching uh, concern. So the <coughs> problem was that was inconsistent with the conceptual site model that everybody had in terms of the importance of vapor transport. And the concerns really grew when the agencies noticed that upon sampling, uh, they were approaching the soil vapor performance goals, even though they were still removing 3,000 you know, pounds a, a quarter. And they said, well, you know, maybe those performance goals aren't very good. And so we entered into discussions with the responsible parties to try and re reset or you know, sort of evaluate a logic, a decision logic about turning off this SVE system. We did not want them to turn off the SVE system if we were pulling out that much mass. And it was very controversial. Uh, we had tense meetings with the responsible parties. 
uh, so the proposal was made, well, let's go ahead and use the SVEET tool as an objective means to reestablish uh, some realistic goals. And, uh, and, and the consultants for the responsible parties agreed to that. They, they actually were happy with that. And <coughs> so we brought in uh, the tool. We had to make some adjustments we'll get to in a bit. Uh, but it became a very collaborative effort because now we were focused on looking at the, da the input data and, and looking at facts as opposed to, you know, the broader picture of, of you know, the, the decision down the road and what the consequences were going to be. We put aside economic issues. We're looking just at the data and, and input values. Um, so really, it, it ended up as a success story where SEAT was very instrumental in resolving this contentious issue. Um, here's just a, a screenshot from the SVEET run for uh, the particular site. Um, a few things about the entry, data entry for this. We had a residual source, as we've been talking about, uh, that was within uh, the deeper part of the Beto zone, and we had to kind of adjust the parameters to stay within the ranges uh, that were allowed by SVEET. But again, just like the example we talked about before, even though we didn't quite match where we thought the mass was, we were close enough that everybody was comfortable using that geometry. We set a, a source area dimension width and, and height uh, based on the monitoring points that tended to have higher concentrations right around the source area. Uh, everybody agreed to that. Um, we had, uh, you know, we did some sensitivity analysis on groundwater velocities. Uh, looking at that effect, came to a consensus on that. One of the, the interesting things that we had to deal with, uh, and this kind of gets to the limitations that we were talking about, is the compliance point uh, distance from the source. Uh, the responsible parties were very interested, and, and, and frankly I was sympathetic to them, to set the compliance point at the edge of the defined Superfund site. And <clears throat> that wasn't the distance that was allowed in SVEET. So what we actually did was kind of clever, I thought, and that this was the responsible party's um, consultants that came up with this, is that they, they actually calculated the concentrations at the allowed distances uh, within SVEET and then fit uh, an exponential function through those values and extrapolated that out to the distance we wanted to use, which was 185 meters away from the source area. The goal that with the feet was really to look at what soil gas concentration we would enter here that would result in a concentration of the groundwater performance goals at that compliance point. So if for TCE, if our goal was five micrograms per liter, we looked at what soil gas concentration within that source zone would yield a five part per billion microgram per liter TC concentration at the compliance well. So that's why it was very important for us to be able to deal with that compliance point uh, issue effectively. And that was, again, a, a consensus uh, that everybody, everybody reached. So it was uh, <coughs> uh, done for a number of different uh, contaminants. The, uh, actually, the uh, results are that um, we've got a report that summarized the process that's now being implemented into an exp a new explanation of significant difference that will lock in the soil vapor perf performance goals. The goals were significantly lower than the previous goals for most of the contaminants. There were actually one or two that went up a little bit, but it, it, it certainly reflects that vapor transport that wasn't accounted for before. So the SVEET tool, given its three-dimensionality, the multiple phases of transfer, you know, was, was very important for matching our conceptual site model at, at the site. There's going to be a, a performance monitoring plan that will be put together that will highlight how we will determine statistically when those goals are being met. Um, it'll still be several years, I think, before we get to there. But anyway, that's kind of a, an example of how SVEET can be used intermediate in the process to actually set your performance goals. Similar things could be done at the start before you even implement the, the SVE.